This has to be the greatest DVD of a manager I've seen from WWE to date. Now, some of you may be like, well, what about the Bobby the Brain Heenan? What about that one, Lee? That one was pretty damn good. What about the Listen, You Pencil Neck Geek, the Freddy Blassie story? What about that one? You know, well, what's up with those two? You know, for me, the Bobby Heenan one, that gets taken off the list because Bobby really didn't do uh, that much talking. He really didn't. It was mainly his colleagues and his kids and his wife that was talking about him. And it's understandable because we know he's been uh, battling a declining health uh, over the years. And if you guys see how he looks now, it's a testament to the strength of will, I feel. Uh, that's continuing to have him go all these years later because, I mean, his jaw has just been... Uh, reconstructed so many times it's it's heartbreaking to see uh how he looks um right now but um i'm getting sidetracked he really didn't do that much talking it was mainly his colleagues and all this it was really kind of hard to appreciate and really get into so for me that one's off the list classy freddie blassie eh you know for for his respected time involved in the wrestling business and all that that's really good for that respected wrestling audience but i just feel with the work of paul Heyman, my god i want it more let me put it to you that way the documentary piece my god it felt like it went about almost three hours or it did run three hours because i remember when i first began watching it i told you guys earlier in the week when i had first got it that i was probably going to be checking it out at least about four times Right now, I'm only at two, but as soon as we get off the air, I'm definitely going to be watching it again because it was that fucking good. I loved it. I really loved it. It's now time to put the RCWR Show Spotlight on the latest WWE release. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Heyman. I am reviewing this for the Blu-ray edition uh, that had came out. And once again, in case you didn't check us out on Tuesday, I want to just give you guys a friendly reminder that if you're trying to find the Blu-ray edition of this, good luck to you because copies are very scarce in retail stores. I had, I was lucky to get my copy from Best Buy, uh, as the lady had informed me, and this was like at about probably three o'clock in the afternoon that they only had like five copies. All right, so you're hearing that first thing you got to be saying to yourself is, wait a minute. Depending on the Best Buy, there's no way that many copies of it could have been sold, right? And I would say to you, touche, touche, because the Best Buy that I went to, it's always empty. Nobody is really in there. I, I, I'm telling you, the WWE DVDs on Blu-ray, I think it's one of those type of deals where it's not what it used to be, I would say, five years ago or even ten years ago when wrestling was still white fucking hot when it was still really popular stores used to be able to make a killing off of this now you're lucky if you can get that bulk of dvds that come out of the store you know and fye is a good example of that because there used to be a time where you didn't have to be concerned about oh i wonder if best buy i wonder if target i wonder if walmart there used to be a time where you went to fye they had it on Blu-ray. You wanted stand. They had your hookup. Now it seems like they're just going with standards. So I can't stress it enough. Uh, you definitely, if you're gonna go for this DVD, do a good online search to see who has it. And if you have a Blu-ray player, definitely get the Blu-ray edition because you get a lot of great exclusives. Where to begin with how this DVD had? Uh, opened up the documentary part wise it picks up pretty much with Paul Heyman growing up as a kid as his father was a very well known and a very well respected uh, insurance lawyer uh, if I'm not mistaken his mom was a holocaust survivor so you just hear that combination right there and you're saying to yourself my god how can this kid go wrong and you're absolutely right uh, Jewish I, I didn't know that Paul Heyman was Jewish. That never did. But then again, I never did really 
kick back and go, well, what's Paul Heyman's real name? I've never done that before. I've always known him as Paul Lee Dangerously. I've always known him as Paul Heyman. Not once did I ever say, is he a white man? Is he Jewish? What is he? It never really dawned on me like that. It just made it even more kick-ass when I had found out that he was Jewish. It's like, wow, okay, cool. Uh, but he talked about how he got involved with Vince McMahon Sr., uh, as he had heard about in the article how Vince McMahon Sr. would go get his hair cut at the Warwick Hotel. And then afterwards, after he was done running his wrestling event at Madison Square Garden, him and an elite circle of his colleagues would go eat at this restaurant not too far from the venue. So, Paul Heyman, at the age of 14... Keep in mind, he already had a really nice small business for himself. Uh, he had got into the field of collecting movie posters, and he was selling them from his home. He was doing very well with that, but he made the transition to take some of his bar mitzvah money that had came for him uh, on a birthday, and he got himself a camera, built his own uh, little photo lab, and he just and I really connected to that part so well because there is that part of me uh, that loves photography myself. And for a lot of years as I was studying photography in high school, I went on various photo assignments and all of that. So there's just that part of me that was smiling big time uh, when he went into this field, because what he ended up doing with all that equipment, he was taking pictures of wrestlers and things of that nature. And he was making like a little newsletter that he would mail out you know it wasn't really that much but he pretty much was looking at that as a nice way to try to get himself involved in the business so he hears about Vince McMahon senior eating at this restaurant getting his hair cut at the Warwick Hotel and all that he somehow managed to get a hold of the phone number for the Capital Wrestling Corporation promotion talk to whoever and say, yeah, I'm supposed to be getting my press pass uh, so I can attend uh, the shows. And sure enough, age of 14, probably like one of the first real hustles that this man had, he managed to get himself a press pass to a Capitol Wrestling Corporation event in Madison Square Garden uh, as a photographer. And the legendary Bill Apter, he talked about how this kid would cost him money i mean every time you turned around this guy was pretty obnoxious to the other photographers because every single time these guys look as though they had a really great shot a good money shot all of a sudden you get an elbow and they're looking and it was paul Heyman. he like just fucked it all up for them and they were pretty mad at him but bill after had talked about how there were three people in particular that took a liking to him. They were sarcastic towards him, but they took a liking to him. And those three people were legendary Freddie Blassie, the Grand Wizard, and Lou Albano. So talk about a great combination right there. One day, Paul Heyman had heard about a Jim Crockett event that was going on. And he managed to get himself travel arrangements to go to this event, be on assignment and all that. And at this point, Dusty Rhodes was the one in charge of writing and producing TV. For Paulie, going into this, he was saying to himself, well, you know, I've learned what I could at this point about how television, the production and all that goes from the McMahons. I'm curious to see how it goes under somebody else. So that was the main reason why he went to this Jim Crockett event. So he managed to sneak himself in. Uh, to the production meeting, and uh, he sees Dusty Rhodes with well, let me tell you with his family jeans and the bean, you know, all that good stuff. And uh, he told this really great story how Dusty Rhodes had saw him, and he was like, Psst, "Hey, come here, you know, what you doing there in the production meeting?" And uh, you know, Paulie's like, "Oh, I'm here on assignment. I'm supposed to be taking photographs and, you know, for the show and all that." And he's like, "No, no, no, no! You're not supposed to be in there. That's the that's the TV production meeting. What you supposed to be doing? You ain't supposed to be in there." And yeah, the that's, uh, Paulie was like, "Well, I just uh, want what I just want to learn what I can from you." And what could have been 
a moment that could have ended in a bad way for him ended up being good because Dusty kind of really appreciated that drive and passion that Paulie had and was like, all right, well, you're learning from the best. And it was pretty much, hey, seal of approval. And Paul would just show up week after week after week, pen and paper, not talking, just jotting down notes. And it's at that early age that you learn Paul Heyman being so, so hunger driven uh, to want to succeed in the business to do whatever he could, you know, and if that meant he had to tell a few fibs or whatever, so be it, you know, but the intention was always good. It was always good in nature, you know, so you fast forward a little bit. And uh, at this point, Paul Heyman, uh, he goes to this event uh, that's happening at Studio 54 as he was good friends with gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. You guys remember gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. I used to love him and Baby Down. Couldn't get enough of them uh, whatsoever. Um, you know, they went to the Studio 54 event. Once again, Heyman with the hustling was able to talk to the top heads at Studio 54 and said, look, I've got a wrestler from a major syndicated wrestling promotion that's seen on television. I'd like to bring him to your uh, your event, you know, do a little meet and greet. And they were like, oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Sure, let's do it. The Studio 54 head photographer was drunk on his ass, and uh, apparently he got kicked out. They really weren't sure what to do. Paul Heyman saw an opportunity. He said, hey, I know a thing or two about photography. I'm your man. Next thing you know, he was the main lead photographer uh, for Studio 54. You guys that uh, know the whole Studio 54, the history and all that, you remember vividly then when the Palladium had opened in 1984. And this had left a big void for Studio 54 because a lot of the employees that worked at Palladium were employees that worked for Studio 54. So the new threat that Studio 54 was facing was, well, what the hell are we going to do for these Friday night shows? What are we going to do for these weekend shows as far as promoting? We really got to do something big. Paul Heyman stepped up. He said, look, I've done promoting work before. Give me the opportunity. No, he hasn't done it before. All right. <laughs> but here he is. He's hustling. He's doing what he can to get the opportunities. And when it counted the most, he shined. So that would lead to Paul Heyman setting up at Studio 54, Wrestle Party 85. And you all may recall, if you know you're wrestling like that, that originally he wanted to try to get an award to Hulk Hogan, but him and the WW, uh, I think at that point it was probably WWF, uh, you know, they were on the West Coast doing some work, so Hogan wasn't available. Uh, Heyman made a call to the Crockett Promotions, and he was able to get Magnum TA, uh, Ric Flair involved, and an award was given to Ric Flair as Heyman also used that opportunity to make the debut of the late Bam Bam Bigelow. Yes, how badass is that? Uh, from there, you know, it was just a short time afterwards uh, that Studio 54 had ended up getting shut down. I believe it shut down maybe like a year later or in 86. Uh, but Paul Heyman, he continued to stay in work. He was doing pay, uh, play-by-play uh, for various wrestling promotions, he had a couple of re uh, he had a couple of uh, wrestling magazine companies that uh, was going on some independent stuff. Uh, Bam Bam and others they had encouraged him that he should really get involved in the wrestling business, in particular as a manager, because they just felt he had the gift. Paul had talked about how he saw this really cool movie with Michael Keaton called uh, Johnny Dangerously, and he was like, well. If I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna need a really cool name. I'm gonna call my I'm gonna call myself Paul E. Dangerously, and that's pretty much how it all had uh, came about. And of course, you all know that know your wrestling. He went on uh, to work with the Motor City Madman, helping out uh, Kevin Sullivan uh, at the uh, CWF promotion the uh, championship wrestling in Florida under uh, NWA. Of course, you all recall uh, Crockett had bought out Florida. Heyman would eventually go down to Memphis where Jerry the King Lawler just 
Memphis, Jerry the King, synonymous. I mean, they're just linked to one another. You can't mention Memphis wrestling without mentioning Jerry Lawler. Jerry Lawler, he talked about how he appreciated the drive that Heyman had. Definitely gave him props for being a very intelligent man. Definitely knew how to press those buttons. But there was just something about him that just radiated too much arrogance, too much cockiness. It, basically, when it was all said and done, it was really hard to do long-term business with Heyman. But when Heyman was there, it was just on fire. Lawler did note that some of his best time involving Paul Heyman uh, had came when he was working with him, Austin Idol, uh, Wildfire, Tommy Rich. Of course, you all uh, heard of the hair versus hair match, uh, which was like a sold-out event at the Mid-South Coliseum. First time ever that Jerry Lawler had lost a hair versus hair match. So talk about a match of epic proportions right there. And it didn't really last any longer than that as, you know, Heyman was basically there for a cup of coffee. In 87, uh, for those of you that are like, yeah, where did he come up with the whole cell phone thing and all that? Well, he was watching one of my favorite movies, Wall Street with Michael Douglas as Gordon Gecko, And he just remembered seeing the movie and seeing that cell phone and was like, man, if I had something like that I, and the rest was just history. So that explains if you're keeping track so far. Paul Heyman has good taste in movies because there's certain movies that he's seeing, he's borrowing certain elements from it to help advance his career as a uh, character, as a manager and all that. He's just been doing a really good job. But uh, in either case, he would end up uh, working for the AWA promotion. Those of you that's been checking out our shows for a long time, you know how much I love, 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 love the AWA promotion. And anytime you knew back then when it was on ESPN, you could catch it daily. And what he would do at like 21 years of age, he would be shooting two interviews and there's like so many interviews that he would tape like in one day that even though the same AWA episode would be showing all week long until the next episode, his interviews was always new. So there was always a reason to go back to keep watching it because you knew you were going to see two new Paul Heyman interviews and all that. It was some really good stuff, man. Uh, after that, he worked the Southern Independence, did some stuff in Alabama, Windy City Wrestling. Um, eventually an opportunity had came about where he got to work with the original Midnight Express and collided with the new Midnight Express over in World Championship Wrestling. Uh, but, you know, as he had said, and for you all that remember how World Class Championship Wrestling was, or uh, World Championship Wrestling was, it, it was like a revolving door of talent. Talent just kept coming and going and seemed like one thing that ended up being a bit consistent was when Heyman had the opportunity to work alongside Jim Ross, which he really did a good job in putting Jim Ross over, saying Jim is just one of those guys, you know, honestly, I learned a lot about the business uh, from Freddie Blassie, Lou Albano, uh, the Grand Wizard, but it was Jim Ross that gave me all the ingredients and really helped me take it to that next level. He really taught me how to really uh, be a good character is what he was really driving home. And he also really stressed how he had most fun uh, working with him, True Class Act and all that. You know, eventually uh, TBS, they had ended up suspending Paul Heyman and it was because as Jim Ross pointed out you know hey as great of a mind as Paul Heyman is there's just that part of him that comes off like a troublesome student a brilliant prodigy but one that could just be very hot-headed when he gets an idea in his head your idea doesn't matter because it's all about his idea him hammering it home that pretty much made him very uh, troublesome to work with. It definitely made it difficult to work with. And TBS suspending him, they really just wanted to have nothing else to do with him. And, you know, eventually TBS, they kind of found themselves to be in a really bad spot uh, towards the end of WCW 
uh, as they say, well, you know what, let's see if we can bring back a new version of the Four Horsemen. And of course, you all remember Rick Rude, uh, Paul Heyman as the new J.J. Dillon, Arn Anderson, Larry Zbysko, uh, Stunning Steve Austin, otherwise known as the Dangerous Alliance. You know, that had pretty much gave that new bolt of energy uh, for WCW and all that, but uh, even at that, you know, it still just really uh, wasn't enough as TBS, Powers That Be, and WCW, they just really, it was a very bad relationship towards the end uh, between the parties involved, as Heyman had briefly touched upon this, and I wasn't even aware of it until he brought it up, but uh, apparently there was a falling out with them that ended in a way where Paul Heyman had sued WCW and TBS, and he stressed that even though it's been like over 21 years later, he still can't talk about it because he has uh, some type of a gag order that was placed on him. But what he did say was that he received a lot of money uh, from the deal. And, you know, he was happy, you know, with moving on uh, afterwards. So, you know, there was a brief time where Heyman had sat out. He didn't do anything wrestling related. If anything, he was looking to go into radio because he wanted to be the new shock jock. He wanted to take on Get this, Howard Stern. And some of you are probably like, why? It really would have been interesting, like in another dimension, like Earth 2 or whatever, to see how Paul Heyman would have been able to do as a shock jock. I think he would have been freaking awesome. I think he would have been freaking awesome. I truly believe he would have given Howard Stern a run for his money. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, Jim Crockett... Um, was in this position uh, where uh, he was looking for a partner, a head creative for a new promotion. And at first, Heyman had declined. One day he had saw this promo and he was getting bashed. Promo basically was saying to Heyman, look, are you going to continue to bitch? Are you going to continue to moan and complain? Look, you're getting an opportunity right here to get off your ass and make a difference. You're talking about changes that you would like to see implemented and why this isn't working. Well, you have this opportunity now on a silver platter. Are you going to be about it or are you just going to continue to bitch? So basically, the way he looked at it was his man card was being pulled. So he accepted the opportunity, and that opportunity came in Eastern Championship Wrestling, ECW. And the rest, as they say, uh, you know, is, uh, is pretty much history. Now, one thing that we had learned during Paul Heyman's time there with the ECW brand is that him and Vince McMahon, they were buddies with one another. He said that Vince McMahon was like one of his greatest allies and he addressed something that's been long going for many, many years now, uh, which is whether or not Heyman was on WWE's payroll. He talked about a meeting that he had with Vince back in 1996 that had saw basically a talent exchange. Basically what ended up happening was Al Snow, Draws, Baracus, they went to Paul so that they could get additional training in ECW. Two Cold Scorpio and some other guys were supposed to go down to the WWF in exchange for this little trade. Now, Paul Heyman has said to Vince, look, I can give you the other two guys, but Two Cold Stor uh, Scorpio, I have a problem with that because we have Tommy Boy Records, which produces the music, for two code Scorpio and like every single time ECW would take a commercial break or whatever basically they were getting like a thousand dollars a week for plugging Tommy Boy Records which was the guys behind two code Scorpio's music so for there to be a week that would go by and like Tommy Boy Records have already given ECW the money to plug themselves basically and their music, not exactly a smart move right there, giving Vince and WWF two coach Scorpio. So Vince goes, okay, I understand that. Well, I tell you what, you sell me the rights, 
I'll cover the thousand dollars a week or whatever. It's okay. I don't mind doing that. Just give me two ghost uh, Scorpio. So Paul Heyman was like, okay, fine. I'll do that then. No problem. So WWE did not pay Paul Heyman. According to Paul Heyman, Paul Heyman never accepted one freaking dollar in his pocket from the WWE. It never happened. He never personally cashed any checks from the WWE. He was never given any cash money uh, off their books. None of that. What ended up happening was WWE, uh, they would basically pay ECW's affiliate, which I think was called HHG. Uh, they would basically put the money in that bank account. So, in essence, it would kind of turn back around and go in the ECW, but Paul Heyman never saw profit from that. So as far as the whole Heyman being on WWE's payroll, according to him, no. I wish that when it got to this point, Vince McMahon would have shown up and he would have debuked the rumors uh, himself to back Heyman. It was so interesting because like when you just looked at the series of people that said whatever with regards to Paul Heyman that were interviewed uh, to chime in their thoughts. Uh, we saw Brock Lesnar. Uh, we saw Larry Zbysko, Raven, CM Punk. Yes, CM Punk was shown more than once. It's very obvious when you look at the footage that this all had came about with CM Punk being interviewed for this DVD before Punk had left the company. Um, Gabe Spawoski, uh, who's the longtime ECW announcer slash promoter, uh, Ron Buffoon, uh, Todd Gordon, the owner of ECW, um, t t I already mentioned Tommy Dreamer, a lot of people that was interviewed for this, Stephanie McMahon, uh, who was, as far as the McMahons go, definitely was one of the most vocalist people, uh, as you watch this documentary part, but no appearance from Triple H, and I'm sure you guys can come up to your own conclusion probably why Triple H didn't have anything to do with this. I know some of you all can remember those times where Triple H would take those cheap shots at ECW, being in the bingo hall, all that. Yeah, maybe it would kind of make sense for him to not be on this DVD, right? Right? But definitely would have been really cool to see Vince McMahon step up and chime light on this whole payroll crap and all that, or just say something about Paul Heyman, period, but we never saw that. I, always weird that we don't see that, you know? It, it's like, it's almost like when you see Vince McMahon on somebody's documentary, it's like he really, really, really loves them. He really messes with them like that. It's like, other than the Ultimate Warrior special, on the WWE Network, I honestly cannot genuinely think of the last time Paul Heyman appeared on somebody else's DVD and, like, put them over. I'm kind of thinking maybe Triple H, the Thy Kingdom Come, maybe he might have said something on there. I'm not really sure, but it is what it is, man. Of course, the demise of ECW was talked about. Basically, for ECW, it came down to expanding uh, needing more investors, getting the parent companies to come in and help them out and all that. There was just so many elements that was coming about for ECW. I mean, they were pulling in really great numbers whenever they did their shows. Uh, they made decent pay-per-view buy rates. Their merchandise was selling like mad crazy. But when it came to expanding, that was the problem uh, that they really had the most. Not to mention all the extravagant spending uh, that was being done in ECW. Todd Gordon, who was handling the purse, he was always yelling at Paul Heyman. It's like, why do you have helicopters on the top of our roof dropping off these people? And, you, know, you know, that's too much spending that's going on. There's just so much craziness uh, that was going down that eventually, you know, we saw Todd Gordon kind of back out a little bit. He backed away from the product even more. And Paul, he put so much of his blood, his sweat, and tears into ECW. He tried to do everything he could using his own personal finances, even getting his parents involved. His parents even came in and donated a boatload of money to try to help keep ECW 
uh, upflow. It was really just a matter of time before ECW met its demise. It ultimately met its demise because Paul Heyman did such an emphasis on micromanaging everything that by the time people that handled the books, the finances and all that came in, it was too late. The damage was already done. ECW was in so much red, there just was no way they were going to be able to pull themselves out of it. And it was just with that little bit of funk that Paul Heyman said to himself, okay, the product that I love and cherish the most, it just kind of seems like we're at this weird stalemate right now. And he just started to get burned out with the product that uh, he stopped showing up for the ECW tapings and all that. Tommy Dreamer had eventually took over and just a handful of days uh, before the ECW uh, going into bankruptcy and all that was announced, uh, Paul Heyman had said to Tommy Dreamer, look, I want you to be the first to know before anybody else that uh, I'm going to be going to the WWF. And like when he told this to Tommy, basically like within three days, Paul Heyman has showed up on an episode of Monday Night Raw. And how bittersweet is that for everything to kind of come full circle at that point as Paul Heyman on his first night in the WWF, there he is again working with good old JR. I mean, talk about full circle right there. A lot of people had thought that Paul Heyman was being a hypocrite. You know, he does all this jabbing to WCW, all this verbal jabbing to the WWF, but here he is on WWF. A lot of people thought he was being a hypocrite. A lot of people had ill will towards him. Something new that was talked about during this DVD, which Heyman and Joey Styles had pointed out, which was when ECW was going through its bankruptcy period, there was a period where Paul Heyman did not make any money for the WWE. He did not sign a WWE contract for a couple of months. And the reason why he did that was because he was trying to buy enough time to process the paperwork for ECW going bankrupt because the way that it's set up from the time that you file for bankruptcy, the creditors and all that, any monies that they're trying to go about collecting, they can do so 90 days prior to when that bankruptcy paperwork was filled out. So in essence, that would mean that they would be within the right to go hunt down all the wrestlers in ECW and make the argument, well, Paul had paid you, so we want that money. Then you would have a bigger shitstorm on your hands. And so Paul Heyman, he took a serious bullet um, for all the parties that was involved in that because ultimately he lost the most uh, with regards to that. Um, but, you know, they talked about his time there uh, in the WWF as uh, <laughs> JR had shined a little bit of light on what it was like to work with Paul Heyman as he felt that. Paul was just pushing the right buttons to legitimately piss him the hell off and all that. Uh, fast forward a little bit, guys. Opportunity had came about where uh, Paul Heyman became one of the lead writers uh, for SmackDown. And he did such a great job as if you really go back to the period when it was under Paul Heyman. I mean, you saw guys like Edge, Eddie Guerrero, Kurt Angle, Rey Mysterio. Uh, you know, they really just started stepping up uh, big time. Meanwhile, you had guys like Hulk Hogan, Undertaker, other big name guys that were still given that proper spotlight that they needed. They weren't being made to look overshadowed by the other guys that Heyman was trying to put that attention on. And Edge, well, a few others, they were like so humble. They were so grateful at the opportunity that Heyman was able uh, to give to them when he took over SmackDown. He also talked about how he came across Brock Lesnar. Look, it's not all about Brock Lesnar and, and Paul Heyman. It turns out the credit that really needs to be given, and I think this man is very underrated, is Taz. Taz apparently had saw some of the work of Brock Lesnar uh, down in developmental OVW and all that. And he basically had said to Paul Heyman, 
look, you got to look at this guy. I think this guy is freaking good, but he he could really use some good help. And so Paul took it to Vince and was like, look at this guy. And Paul was like, okay, well, do you gel with him pretty good? What's y'all's chemistry like? Paul's like, it's pretty good. It's on point. We're kind of cool like that. And Vince was like, okay, from here on out, you're working with him. And that's pretty much how the Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman alliance was born and all that. One of the main things that Paul Heyman uh, kept noticing was as much as he was in charge of SmackDown, which he deemed as the bitch show, <laughs> because a lot of people, and I'm sure if you've checked out enough shoot interviews and all that, you know, like from Bruce Pritchard, uh, uh, Michael Hayes, he's talked about it at various points. A lot of people have referred to SmackDown as the red-haired stepsister of the WWE because Raw gets the first priority and all that, and like, eh, who cares about SmackDown? Paul Heyman, when he was the lead writer, he was looking to change those things. But unlike when he was in ECW, where he had free reign, he had to answer uh, to certain people. Because after all, this was a company that no doubt had to answer to corporate investors and, and, and all that good stuff. So, very unique position that Paul Heyman uh, found himself in. But uh, for the most part, he seemed to be going pretty good but a storm was brewing and it was gonna happen now something that we learned was originally when it came to the ecw uh one night only event the one night stand back in 2005 paul Heyman loved it he wished they would have been one and done well shane mcmahon had a very interesting idea and it probably would have worked out very, very well. It really makes you wonder. But Shane McMahon had this really cool idea to bring ECW back. Bring it back in like the same type of style, the same type of format. Let it be an exclusive show that can only be seen on WWE.com. Sounds good, don't it? Sounds damn good. Bring back the whole nostalgia, everything. Just bring it back. Well, that ended up getting sabotaged because there was a network that had approached WWE because they had caught wind of WWE being interested in launching a third show or whatever. And they were like, oh, well, our studies have shown that, you know, in the past when you guys had did ECW, this had worked out pretty well. If you guys would be willing to, you know, maybe do that with us, we'd love it. And so, boom, there you go. And then the domino effect would be not only did you have the networks interested, but then the pay-per-view distributors caught when, oh, you guys are thinking about doing ECW. Well, we'd give you money to see those. Yeah, we'd love to see that. So, so much for the ECW concept being on WWE or WWF.com. Paul Heyman, CM Punk, Big Show, RVD, Everybody, they all just pretty much said the same thing. WWE's version of ECW, it sucked. It was like a really bad time. Paul was so frustrated with the creative direction that was going on. It was kind of interesting how Stephanie McMahon did not really give Paul Heyman props as far as, you know, I can understand where he was coming from because this was his product. And I think Tommy Dreamer summed it up very well. He basically said, it's like, watching your son grow up and then at some point a new stepdad comes in to raise your son yeah it was kind of like that and Paul just had a really hard time stomaching that and he was trying to be very hell-bent uh, as much as possible one of probably the only good things that come about that came about from that whole ECW deal was CM Punk that was it, because CM Punk was down there uh, in OVW and all that. And as you all know, eventually WWE, they had sent Paul Heyman off to OVW to help out with the uh, developmental talent. And a lot of people kind of looked at that as him being demoted. Paul Heyman looked at that as an opportunity to help craft the stars of tomorrow. He looked at it uh, as a challenge, which he embraced. And 
He loved being able to get the opportunities to work with CM Punk, Beth Phoenix, who would go on uh, to do really great things, Mr. Anderson, uh, Mr. Kennedy, as some of you guys uh, still may know him as. Uh, but, you know, one day there was just this big explosion of a uh, argument that went down between Vince McMahon, Paul Heyman, and pretty much that ended uh, Paul Heyman's time there in uh, World Wrestling Entertainment. From there, uh, he had uh, looked into trying to start up a Strike Force MMA promotion, but that didn't really fall through. Uh, he's got his uh, company, Looking for Larry, which is basically, from what I'm kind of un- able to understand, it's kind of like this branding slash ad campaign company or whatever uh basically him and the people involved with that company they also had helped get the Heyman hustle together um also through that company looking for larry they were the ones responsible for the ultimate warrior wwe 2k15 uh spot so pretty badass right there. I wonder if they were also responsible for the Sting one. I guess we won't know uh, until otherwise it's specified. Uh, but, you know, he just talked about how he was doing pretty good and enjoying life, his kids, all that good stuff. Uh, but that one day, because he's always been friends with Brock Lesnar, and he saw that Brock Lesnar uh, had ended his run in the UFC, and he took up WWE on an offer to return to the company. They gave him a call and said, how would you like to come back? Work with Brock Lesnar. Whatever went down in the past, it's water under the bridge. And that was pretty much it. I mean, the rest is pretty much history. Uh, as you all know, that's been checking out the WWE product uh, up to this point. Uh, overall, I got to say, it was a really, really great uh, documentary piece if I had to nitpick on just one or two areas I, I wish we would have known a little bit more on just how the opportunity really presented itself to uh, have Paul Heyman come on back uh, to the WWE rather than just throw a little crumb out there and you just kind of come to your own conclusion uh, I also wish that Vince McMahon would have made an appearance and Definitely at least back up uh, what Paul Heyman was saying as far as the meeting goes and everything. I love the fact that Stephanie McMahon, uh, you know, said what she said about Paul. I could genuinely tell that Stephanie has an appreciation for Paul. I could tell that genuinely. Um... Sucks that Shane McMahon was not part of this because I definitely would have loved to have heard what he envisioned... Uh, for ECW coming back and all that. Yeah, I'm quite sure that what ended up happening with it uh, being on TV probably was not what he had in mind. Um, but it's a really great full circle of a story because you can appreciate the evolution of the Paul Heyman character over the years. And on top of that, you really come to respect more the man himself, especially where he is at this point of his life right now as he has two beautiful kids and he's trying to do everything he can to make sure that he lays down the right type of a legacy for them, you know, because it's pretty obvious that he wants them to succeed in everything, especially in the areas maybe of which he might have failed. Uh, but his whole thing is his legacy is his kids, and he's just enjoying life, man. He just really comes off as a guy uh, that finally, when he had the opportunity to get away from wrestling for a few years, just get himself in order, get his house in order, and just start breathing and enjoying life again. And now he has this opportunity where he's on a limited schedule and he can still do what he does best, which is just be an on-air character. He doesn't have to worry about being involved with writing and producing television, uh, developmental with the talent. He doesn't have to worry about any of that crap. All he needs to know is where he's going, what time he needs to be there, you know, and he's on point. He's doing some of the best work. I think ever 
in his time uh, with the WWE. That is our review for the Paul Heyman, ladies and gentlemen. I said that wrong, didn't I? That is, <laughs> that is your review for the ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Heyman. I definitely have to give this a 10 out of 10. Some really good stuff right here. Uh, for those of you that are curious on what all is on disc 2, basically it's promos it's nothing but promos you've got three matches on the second disc which consists of the original midnight express taking on the new midnight express from 1989 the hardy boys taking on brock lesnar and paul Heyman, judgment day from 2002 no disqualification handicap match cm punk versus curtis axel paul Heyman, night of champions 2013 uh, Blu-ray exclusives, it looks like there's a lot more stories that you can check out. And uh, at the end, there's a cool promo for the Conquer uh, of the Streak, which was on Raw April 7, 2014. You all remember that. That was pretty much the night after WrestleMania, and Paul Heyman had cut another infamous promo right there. Some good stuff. 